It's an honor, a privilege, uh, and a great opportunity to be able to speak at this uh, summit. Um, I have my bosses sitting right here, um, probably supervising me, so I need to be careful of what I'm going to say. Um, basically, <laughs> basically, uh, when I thought about this, um, this summit, uh, even though I didn't know the scope and I have never participated in such kind of a summit, I was just thinking of the Millennium Development Goal. How far have we come? 13 years almost, and then two years to go. So I think um, when I chose the topic, I, topi I, I chose the topic of struggle transformed into synergy um, because um, in my view, each country is struggling to achieve the Millennium Development Goal. Uh, in the context of Africa, you can see all the reports that are published for each country. Some have uh, achieved much, uh, some have not achieved, you know, that much and uh, some are on track on some issues and off track on some issues. So, um, but you know, can this progress be made whole? Can we, can it be accelerated uh, to achieve all, to meet all the goals by 2015? So, and I believe that this can happen only through synergy, which is basically the team for the summit, which is cross-continental cooperation and uh, it's suggestive of collaboration. So the MDG is near its completion, left with more, uh, two more years. African countries have achieved, have achieved much, but yet have a long way to go to meet all the goals. So according to the UNDP, they have put down a, a kind of a, uh, a general uh, report for all African countries, even though the reports are different for each country. Um, they put like poverty reduction lags behind growth. That's one of the things. Yes, there has been, um, you know, uh, reduction in poverty, but not to the point that it has uh, been planned for. Inequality is undermining efforts to reduce poverty. Um, attending primary school is becoming the norm, and it's really good that when uh, an African now is giving birth to a child, automatically thinks of sending the child to school. But at the same time, the quality of education is in question. Um, progress towards gender parity is encouraging from where it was compared to where it was. It's very encouraging, but not quite to the point that it has been planned for. Despite good progress, Africa still has the greatest burden of child and maternal diseases. And Africa has alt halted the spread of HIV, AIDS, tuberculosis, and malaria. There is a mixed progress on ensuring environmental sustainability and food insecurity is a recurring challenge. I'm not going to preach you about the MDG progress because most of you are scholars who have read about the MDG, but my point is all of the above statements given by the UNDP uh, shows struggle in the progress. I think they show change, but with obstacles and strive for betterment with glitches. So I am proud and applaud this great achievement as an African. Uh, and strongly believe that the two years left should not be of discouragement, but I think they need to be for a great opportunity to work together. So the two years left are very short compared to the 13 years that we have traveled so far. So the only option that we have is acceleration. And uh, if we commit to meet the stated goals, we need to accelerate. So acceleration is attainable with synergy um, and a force that comes from a strong team. So when I think of MDG or any other goal for Africa, I think that the idea of a team clicks in my mind. What if Africa chooses to act as a team rather than a group? My colleague earlier was talking about cooperation between African countries, right? Uh, we are a group of countries because we share boundaries. We are in the same geographical place. But can we be a team? Can we work together? Um, what if? All of us choose to know each other and invest in ourselves to complement each other in attaining our goals. If I ask questions in this, in this room, where we're mostly Africans, how much do we know of our, of, about other African countries? If I ask individually, how, how much do you know about Ethiopia? How much do I know about Nigeria? How much do I know about Kenya? Am I interested in knowing this? I think, I think we need to ask ourselves. I know that MDG is a big thing, AU summit is going on. We're probably talking about leadership, about government, about you know, political powers and things like that. But let's ask ourselves, how much do we know about each other? Are we interested in knowing about each other? So those are the points that we need to really focus on. So what if we want to share accountability and celebrate rewards throughout the journey? 
because if we work together, then we'll be asked together, we'll be accountable for the results, but at the same time celebrating our achievements together. So with effective teams come clear unity, self-consciousness, discussion, clear goal, comfort, expression of ideas, decision making, disagreement, criticism, which is not necessarily a bad thing, but it can develop us, individual responsibility and shift in leadership, which we do not really see oftentimes in Africa. Can we let go our leadership so that a better person can lead? Can we let go of what we have? For example, if Ethiopia is doing well in one goal and Nigeria is doing in another, can we just exchange leadership? Can leadership shift between us? So these are the points that are really very, very important in, the, in team building. So all of the mentioned uh, characteristics reflect on the way we do things and the representation of this way embracing the, the way of others. And this is exactly what cultural diplomacy means. So since culture is the way we do things, it's a simple definition for culture, it's the way we do things. And then diplomacy is how we represent our culture embracing that of others. So when we talk about cultural diplomacy and the definition, um, the, the formal definition says that cultural diplomacy is a type of public diplomacy and soft power that includes the exchange of ideas, information, art, and other aspects of culture among nations and their people in order to foster mutual understanding. So the purpose of cultural diplomacy is for the people of a foreign nation to develop an understanding of the nation's ideals and institution in an effort to build broad support for economic and political goals. In essence, cultural diplomacy reveals the soul of a nation. And I believe which in turn creates influence and the soul of a nation is always its people, its human capital. So the application of cultural diplomacy is hence a way to invest in human capital. If I am willing to learn about other African countries, then I will be investing in myself. If I'm willing to teach about other African countries, then I'm willing to invest in human capital. This is very key to us. So the Institute of Cultural Diplomacy, ICD states that Africa is characterized by a myriad of different identities, cultures, and traditions. And this form of young leaders seeks to celebrate and recognize the, advent the advantages of such diversity. And I believe one of the advantages of cultural diplomacy is building a great synergetic team. So cultural diplomacy could be seen as one way to invest in the, in the African human capital, transforming our minds into having the right attitude towards others and will to know and to be known, the will to give and receive, the will to teach and to learn and will to collaborate and achieve. So it's the realization of mutual understanding to work together. Africa is rich with resources. There is no question about Africa being rich, but needs unlocking the potential of its people through cultural diplomacy displayed in the form of education, <coughs> experience sharing, tradition, music, art, research, evidently through people's, people's action. As Africans, we need to develop ourselves to our fullest potential to create, to change and achieve. And when I say creativity, even though, for example, in this room, some of us would not really believe in attaining the Millennium Development Goal, then we, if we invest in our human capital, we can create new goals that are more plausible. That's, that's, not, that's an option. We don't have to, to continue you know, working on something that we don't believe. If we are investing in the human capital and we know that what we're following is not right, then we have the ability to create a new one. That's, that's the point, I guess. So the Institute of um, Africa is rich in resource, definitely. And then as Africans, we need to develop ourselves to the fullest potential to create change and achieve. We need to commit ourselves to the set goals. Together, we can create synergy which exceeds the additive value of individual struggle. So in team building, you know, one plus one is not always two. In team building, one plus one is always greater than two. One country, if you see the reports for the Millennium Development Goal, it's so different for each country. But what if each country doesn't struggle alone, but comes together to work on this Millennium Development Goal and accelerate so that they can make up for the lost 13 years, if anything has happened before. So acceleration, you know, the pace in achieving even greater results in the two years to come compared to the 13 years past. Why do, do we lose, lose hope in thinking that 13 years has passed, two years is very short, we're not going to meet the development goal. I don't think that's, that should be the attitude that we have. I think the attitude that we have should be, in the 13 years we haven't cooperated or collaborated to work, what if we collaborate in the two, two years? I dare you, maybe we can achieve more in the two years than the 13 years back. So this is the attitude that we should have as, as Africans. So the trick is not always to work harder. I think it's always 
to work also smarter. So if it takes 15 years to attend the MDG for one country, this yet to be achieved goals can be met in much lesser time with many country teaming instead of struggling individually. Even achieving beyond the set goal can be dared because collaboration yields much more than competition. This afternoon, let's all think of shifting your gear of, of your agenda, research, suggestion towards synergetic team effort through cultural diplomacy in asking individually ourselves, what have we done to learn about each country's? What do we know? Do we know more about other countries than African countries? Do we have the interest of learning about other countries in our continent? Or do we completely avoid knowing about our own continent countries? Those are the questions that we need to ask ourselves. How much do we know about our own country? How much do we value what we have in the continent? Because there is a lot to value. This two terms, you know, the, uh, so uh, when we think about synergistic team effort and true cultural, diplo uh, cultural diplomacy, these two terms refer to people rather than events or materials because there is no problem of materials or resources in Africa. It's all about people. It's all about, all about leadership. It's all about, you know, self-leadership itself. When we think about leadership, we don't, th we don't have to think about power or position. I think it's all self. So how much did we invest in ourselves? And how much did we invest in the ones that we can invest in? That's the question that comes to my, so it should come to our mind. So um, they refer to the master key, which is the human mind, which has the ability to survive, to create, and excel. If we work as a team, we'll be learning from each other, and we will support each other to achieve our goal together. We can definitely turn our individual struggle into synergy and excel in our cross-continental cooperation. And today, if I ask you a question, I just want you to think us, do you believe that Africans, specifically uh, focused for the Millennium Development Goal, is working as a team or as a group? Because if we're not working as a team, that's what exactly what we need to do. So uh, I am done with my presentation since we have uh, used a lot of time. Uh, and then it's open for discussion. <laughs> You're welcome. Yeah, I'm myself, what do you think, uh, what are the barriers for this cooperation? Why do you think this, this cooperation didn't happen in the way that you, you think it should be conducted? Uh, I think, um, personally, personally, and I think, I think myself as an example. In, our li in, in my life, for example, I have already, you know, the books that we read, uh, the things that we learn in school, they're not really all African oriented. So you don't develop their interests from childhood. And really there is much more to see and to know and to learn in Africa. And the other, uh, the other problem that I see is Africa doesn't have a writing culture. So there's no much writing of African cultures that you can refer to. For example, when I did my master's, I was working on um, international adoption, uh, leadership in international adoption for Ethiopia. But all the references that I got, much of the references were not really based on Africa or Ethiopia. So I think there are many factors playing around, but I guess much more is most of personal interest in knowing what is going on in our own continent and even in our own country. But I guess the others also can, can add. From an outsider point of view, sometimes we see a unity in Africa, and this unity that we see in Africa from a cultural point of view, I think we see it sometimes more for I from ignorance of not really knowing the culture of each country. Yeah. But we really have the feeling from the outside that Africa has a cultural uh, share identity, uh, like a common share identity. And uh, sometimes I even have the feeling that the African share identity is stronger than the European one. Perhaps when I'm, we, we have a lot of debates uh, in, uh, in the ICD and a lot of conference also focus on the European Union. And I, I ask a lot to the people that are attending that from countries of the European Union. And I said, like, do you have the feeling of being European? And what does it mean? And most of the people, it's not that clear what is to be European. And in Europe, we feel very much like our country. And if somebody asks me where you're from, I would say I'm from Spain. And in general, I would not say I'm from Europe, because we're still also working on that. So from, it's very interesting for, for me, for example, to see what you mentioned here, because um, maybe you, you need to, to work on this uh, shared identity just to know what it is. But from an outsider point of view, we need to know the specific cultures and then to figure out what is common to all of them. So I don't want to take more time. Just, uh, <laughs> no, that's a very good point. And that's why I actually mentioned a group versus a team. 
yes, we are located in the same areas, geographically located in the same area, and you share boundaries. And there are some commonalities for somebody who looks at us from the outside. But if you're asking each individual in here how much they know about other African countries and cultures, it's just because there is a similarity that you could notice from the outside. But interest-wise, do we really know about it? And do we really have the interest of knowing it? I think even if we have a little bit, we need to develop it to the point where we can actually exploit it. That's the point that I was trying to make. For your articulation. Um, you know, I, I'm a Pan-Africanist myself. Uh, and when I, I also give lectures on Pan-Africanism here, I think the problem lies that when you look at the former colonial powers, some of the French speaking, the English speaking, the Portuguese one, and Ethiopia has a very different, a unique history. So in a way, the, 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 the boundaries created by colonialism has also become a, an obstacle to us. Secondly, the leaders also. The leaders are partly are also a problem in a sense that look what's happening in Eritrea, Ethiopia. Look what's happening in Sudan itself. I mean, I stress the issue of leadership. And this is simply because, uh, look, I, I, I do give lectures to some officials of Southern Sudan. And um, I cannot see but lack of uh, what I could say selfless leaders. Many of the people of Southern Sudan are living like animals. And yet, the, the, power, the, the people in power are, are creating a problem for their own people. The same applies, I mean, also in Nigeria, Northeast and Nigeria, uh, example. Uh, the Republic of Congo. Uh, many other, I can mention a number of other countries that themselves are in turmoil. So in order for my good sister to engage, to create a team, there must be an environment where to facilitate in terms of trade, in terms of communication, uh, open up our, our borders. We should not be tied to the former colonial boundaries, uh, to be very honest. We should have free movement of goods. Look, you need to have a passport to move from one African country to another one. We should have free movement of goods, free movement of, good of, of, of services, and free movement of Africans. That's what we need. Without that, we cannot engage into people-to-people -people reaction. We, we need also the inter-Africa partnership as well. Frankly speaking, I'm, I, may, I'm, I like to apologize. Sometimes I go to a number of conferences. Sometimes Africa ha is not sh doesn't have shortage of educated people. I think primarily relies on lack of commitment and dedication. This is what I see as a major problem. I mean, I go to a number of conferences and I can say, why is Africa poor when I look at this kind of resources? So to me, um, uh, the issue of Af Pan-Africanism is absolutely crucial. I mean, look, Nkrumah gave a lecture about African unity. Emperor Haile Selassie gave uh, in 1963. Now we are in 1964, more than 50 years. So you ask yourself, I, 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 we could have done more. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So what, what I'm trying to say is that uh, the leadership, we should not ignore it. The role of educated people, we should not uh, ignore it. But at the same time, in order to have a team spirit, we need to, um, in other words, not to talk about borders. What is what happening in Ethiopia and Eritrea? Look what's happening in South Sudan. Look what's happening in the Republic of Congo. I mean, that very much depends on leadership. It's not that we, we have no problem among ourselves, as you know. We are educated people. We are middle class. We have been educated. So I see no problem. The problem lies on people who control power. I cannot move to any other African country unless the borders are made irrelevant, unless we have regional integration, unless there is trade in services, education, and so forth. So I like to support your argument having a team, but that team very much depends on enabling environment in terms of contact between people to people, between educations as well, between our leaders as well. But when you look at our leaders, sometimes they quarrel like children. You know, I mean, sometimes they agree, sometimes they disagree, and they, they create an obstacle. So to me, to be very honest, the question of lead selfless leadership is cardinal. Uh, thank you so much. Because uh, uh, except if there are uh, uh, empirical, you see, we, we have this uh, Africa peer review, goes around, share experiences, so that I know what happened in Ethiopia, 
the root of these reports are there. We have lots of regional movements and that. This synergy at, at I'm from Nigeria. This synergy at a level of, I know you mean at all levels, but I'm wondering in, in, in getting this MDG right. It, uh, yeah, generally synergy is critical, but I'm finding it difficult to believe that there hasn't been synergy. Because deeply, if you look at implementation of the MDGs and country programs, the way it's linked to policies and stuff like that, there have been lots of sharing of ideas, lots of UN teams, World Bank teams, people working together, comparing notes. But most importantly, the, the, the Africa peer review, which uh, shows me how I can learn something from Ethiopia, can learn something from Kenya. Uh, so this synergy in the next two years, I don't know what, what strategy in this synergy that we need to get right, because for me, in every system, every structure of synergy uh, has been explored, and it's, it's, it's fully on. Even within countries, for instance, in, in my country, uh, MDG is strongly weaved around the ministries, department, and agencies of government. It's not even a standalone program. So there is full accommodation. There is full. So I, I really want to know the next gear of synergy. Okay. Yes, uh, <laughs> yes, I can't really thank you enough uh, because you've again emphasized this very strong point that some of us strongly believe in. We can't move forward unless we pull down the borders and become one family. There's just no option. Yeah, the major, like I mentioned in the morning, the major institution, is it, even in, okay, let's uh, take it this way. In countries where or wherever you see the issue of corruption, nobody takes money from his family to distribute to the wider community. People steal from the wider community to their family. Therefore, if you want to solve the problem of corruption, become a family. Therefore, if, if all of us are family members as, as Africa, no one will steal from us, eh, from his family, and take to Europe. You, you understand? People would like to go and take from somewhere and bring back to their family. But unfortunately, we have a divided family. A family where the elder brother is against the younger brother. So I agree with you in totality, the need for teamwork. So. He mentioned about best uh, sharing of experiences, uh, peer mechanism, and yes, when they share these experiences, it's a great idea to share, but do they utilize the experiences? This is the, the key point. If we find out that Ethiopia is leading in the issue of education, why can't Ethiopia become the coordinating minister for education for Africa and replicate this example throughout uh, uh, no, 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 this is the, if, if we have, because when we still worry about uh, he's Ethiopian, he's a Nigerian, then we're not going to get the issue done. If we find anywhere within Africa that we can get the best, let's push that person as the best in that area. Maybe we go to Nigeria, they have a lot of oil. Okay, Nigeria be in charge of oil. We go to another area, they have something else. I, I think if we do work like this, is more like... Uh, uh, the team stuff you've mentioned. We have had former ministers, former presidents of countries who did well in certain areas. After that national leadership, where are they? They disappear. Why can't we use them at the African Union level? Why is someone who has not led the nation before the chair of the African Union when we have former heads of states? So, so I, I strongly support the idea of uh, cooperation with Africa, and I would recommend that we, we promote strongly. Yeah, well, that I've said that a number of times. The unified states of Africa. Uh, we already have African Union and uh, OAU, unified states of Africa, and become one, one entity. In addition, to drive that, let us promote intra African marriage. Let us, yeah, yeah, let us promote intra African marriage. Yes, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yes, I'm a practical example. I'm from West of Africa. My wife is from East of Africa because I believe in this. And I have a home in Tanzania, just as I have a home in Nigeria. So I believe that if many of us begin to intermarry, if we begin to intermarry, we can raise a new generation of Africans who have grown beyond the national barriers. I, I strongly cannot thank you enough for your submission. Thank you and God bless you. Thank <laughs> you.
Um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, my name is Tracy. I'm from Kenya. And um, thank you. You have been um, proposing this idea on um, African marriage and dropping the borders. It is not that cut and dry as you make it sound. Um, beyond having 500 languages in Nigeria, going to South Africa where they have 11 official languages, and I've studied there. I'm a, I'm a scholar at the University of Cape Town. And um, I feel we need to first become critical. Critical and understand that by sitting at this round table, and I think I mentioned it to a gentleman earlier, that um, we need to go above and beyond just discussing the MDGs. The MDGs are a goalpost, like soccer. You shoot and score or you shoot and miss, right? So beyond 2015 is to see that we can meet them um, we can have the goalpost of 2015. We can have the goalpost shift to 2030. But it doesn't mean that we compromise on the standard of living. We have 2015 MDGs as a standard objective set internationally. The concern would be to bring it back to where you're from and grow it and adopt the objective and manipulate it to suit the people who you leave it. Amharic is not spoken anywhere else on this continent. So by the time you are telling us to drop the borders and come and learn Amharic or teach someone in English before they understand why I actually need to have this education. And education is not just going to school and learning how to read and write for me to be able to interact with you or be productive and gain a skill. It's above and beyond being critical. It's above and beyond being ethical. And I think that's what we miss. That's the point that we are missing. I agree with you with the need of cooperating and coming together. Interest is built by exposure. And that's why I'm here. That's why you went to school where you went to school in Europe. And it takes you to have the drive. Then it goes back to your point on leadership. I don't believe our leadership lies with our heads of state. It doesn't lie with the people governing us. It lies with me and you. It lies with the household that you run, the children that you teach and you tell them, these are the virtues you need to have. These are the ethics that you need to uphold. This is what conforms the society for us to live together. And through that form of leadership, we become democratically aware and we become intolerant of the incompetence and the and the manipulation and the corruption that our leaders are having, whereby all they do is create some form of elitism to exempt themselves and alleviate themselves from poverty and continue to increase themselves. And I think through that and through encouraging women at such platforms is going to create an opportunity for us to grow consistently. Not to say that gentlemen don't think, but we need to open that door. We need to open that platform where you and I are able to listen to me. I'm able to listen to your interests. That's the art of diplomacy. Thank you. Uh, frankly speaking, I beg, I beg to disagree. And for the, f for the following reasons, particularly in the area of uh, what do the What do the people, the ordinary people of South Sudan have? Do they have the right? What do the people of... Okay, I'll, I'll discuss about it. My, 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 my concern is that, look, if you look at the United States, the people who, who regard themselves as the mother of democracy have elected Reagan, a stupid guy like Reagan and, 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 and Bush. And the people, the mother of democracy have elected Thatcher in Britain for 10 years. And the people of great Russians have elected, you know, a drunkard like Yeltsin. So the problem is, I have a problem. I may be wrong, but my, the challenge I want to you is, what power do ordinary people have to make a difference? We had a discussion about three weeks ago here, and we said she was one of the speakers. And I had to enter into a dialogue with the guy. Hey, it depends with us on, as individuals. Yes, as, as household term, I know how to manage my house, okay? But at, at, at a macro level, at a, at a macro level, the economic policy, the fiscal policy, the monetary policy, and so forth, is very much dependent on, on at higher level. It becomes too complicated for them. Do I believe in, in empowerment? Yes, I do. But in order to be empowered, you have to be educated. You have to be aware of it. So my question to you is that if I want to uh, eliminate, for example, drug, drug addiction in this country, 
or corruption. I can pray, I can talk, I can write, but I have no influence. So you need strong states, but this strong and effective states must have good leadership as well. Thank you. How many scholars do we have who are drug addicts? I'm, I, I do not mean that education is inefficient or s insufficient. What I'm trying to put across is it, it, it bogs down to me and you being able to sit down and realize you and I who have the knowledge before the children we are trying to educate that we have ethics and we have morals that we need to uphold. With that, the rippling effect, with that, the rippling effect boils down to the leaders that we have who govern the state. It, 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 it creates a rippling effect. It, it builds on rather than just um, having leaders who are not ethical. I'm not saying we are, they're not educated. I'm not dismissing education for, for, for God's sake. I'm not. And I think we need, that's, 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 the, that's the route I feel we need, to, we need to venture into. Build a grassroots on ethics and morals that our mothers and fathers knew, that you, that the elders like you knew before we knew. Thank you. I say that um, I have British citizenship, but I'm Af uh, a Kenyan. One of the things that uh, has been articulated uh, here by several um, uh, learned um, um, uh, um, personalities uh, of the African continent, if I may put it that uh, so, is the poor leadership and um, uh, poor vision of uh, our leaders in, um, uh, in most countries, where you have uh, conflict, you have uh, all sorts of ills. Now, which is quite true, but then uh, there's the role of the citizen, as a citizen, that um, you are influenced or impacted by such um, leadership, what is your role? What is your reaction to certain uh, issues? Can you intervene in your personal um, uh, way? My answer is uh, that um, it is time that ordinary citizens feel obligated where applicable to have an intervention. An intervention that can change the social mood, can change um, uh, the direction of the countries, and um, give uh, positive results. I'll give a good example is that um, for those of you who have followed the Kenya situation towards um, last, uh, last year's uh, elections, uh, from um, August uh, 2012, there has been killings and um, uh, conflict in the Tana River Delta, which uh, continued up to early January, two months before elections. And when uh, the situation became unsustainable and escalated, um, I, I took it as my obligation really to call the people back home because I come from the Tane River. I know the people. And the villages that um, are being killed, whether it's, um, it's um, one or the other groups, I know them personally. So I called the leaders, the elders. I told them, okay, I want the key leaders of the community, the two communities, you identify them. I want to talk to them as individuals, that they can bring peace to the people. Because that conflict is not um, uh, good for the people themselves. It is not um, uh, good for the country. The country is going into an election, and um, uh, everybody will be a loser in the country. And we formed, um, uh, uh, we initiated um, a people's committee. Within a week, the government also formed um, a, a peace committee. And the solution came down. The clashes, killings ceased without um, uh, any problem because uh, the, uh, the government was giving um, um, emphasis on eight guns that uh, were stolen when the soldiers were killed, but um, uh, not uh, really looking at real solutions. So my, pro my, 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 my input here, and I give that um, as an example that uh, as a, you as a citizen can influence change of governance, change of um, uh, attitude, and it is our mission. We take it as our mission to change the course of the African um, future by utilizing our skills and whatever influence we have, however small. Thank you.
I, I, yeah, I think most of the discussion and the, the point um, reason um, I think they are very interesting. Um, and uh, again, I thank you for this opportunity that you gave me to talk about this. Um, I think, you know, when you talk about the synergy thing, um, I always measure um, uh, things or like results on their fruit. So with all the discussion that you mentioned, what did we attend? Did we attend the result of synergy? Did we accelerate? If not, then there are something wrong. So we need to evaluate what we have been doing. If we have not make it practical, then we need to make it practical. That's um, one of the things that I wanted to mention. And then on the, probably on the nice debate that we had about investing in yourself, I believe that you know, we shouldn't under, underestimate ourselves in our contribution. Whoever it is, you know, whatever I do, and if I do it with good conscience, I think my little contribution can go far away. So that's what we need to believe in for people who are in this house. I mean, not talking about the you know, AU summit or the heads of states or so, but as a person, Sion, can, what should, can she contribute in this regards? And then it's not about the MDG, you know? It can be of any other goal. And I believe that, as I said in my uh, presentation, that if we challenge the MDG and we don't believe in it, then we can create a new one, right? So that's how we need to develop ourselves and invest in our human capital. But at the end, what I want to say is my aim of my presentation was to trigger you to think, and I think I did that. So it's not the idea, but I think I, I put something in all of you, and that, that was my aim. And thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. <laughs>